Is it me or does it feel like every day the Harris campaign unearths some new clip of J.D. Vance repeating the same exact offensive ideas about childless women? It's not some gotcha moment. Like, the guy very clearly believes what he's saying. It's, it's not just a few childless cat lady moments here or there. For years, Vance has been appearing on lots of right-wing bro podcasts talking about how women's only purpose on this earth is to give birth to children. And that if these women do not fulfill said purpose, they are both miserable and useless. We're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made. And so they want to make the rest of the country miserable, too. If you look at Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, AOC, the entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. And how does it make any sense that we've turned our country over to people who don't really have a direct stake in it? You go on Twitter and almost always the people who are most deranged and most psychotic are people who don't have kids at home. There's so many of the leaders of the left, and I hate to be so personal about this, but they're people without kids trying to brainwash the minds of our children. When Randy Weingarten, who's the head of the most powerful teaching union in the country, she doesn't have a single child. If she wants to brainwash and destroy the minds of children, she should have some of her own and leave ours to hell alone. Now, we just got another one. This is J.D. Vance on a podcast in 2021. I'm going to play it for you at length because I think it's really worth hearing the Republican nominee for vice president fully explain this worldview. What elite culture does, what these elite institutions do, is they take some very smart people in our society, they filter them into a very small place, and they basically tell them to want the same things. Clerkships, law firm jobs, consulting gigs, you know, nice cushy jobs at private equity firms. And they tell them that the only way they're gonna be happy is to get those things. And so those people end up focusing on career and on credential at the expense of the things that actually make people happy. And so you have people at Yale Law School, you have women who think that truly the liberationist path is to spend 90 hours a week working in a cubicle at McKinsey instead of starting a family and having children. To me, what it is, is, is sort of a value system to replace the fact that they're all fundamentally atheist or agnostic. They have no real value system. Their only value system is achieve in a very conventional way. And so the idea that somehow they're pursuing racial or gender equity is like the value system that gives their life meaning. Clearly this value set has made me a miserable person who can't have kids because I already you know, passed the biological period when it was possible. And I live in a 1200 square foot apartment in New York and I pay $5,000 a month for it, but I'm really better than these other people. What I'm gonna do is project my like racial and gender sensitivities on the rest of them. And like the reason that our society is broken is because these people don't think the exact way that I think, even though the way that I think has made me a miserable person, I just need to make more people think like that. Just the women, you notice. The guys that work 90 hours a week at McKinsey, that's great, I guess. It's no accident J.D. Vance repeated these ideas so often. He was speaking to a specific audience as he auditioned for a role as a future of the Republican Party. And the spot he now holds on the ticket you know, influential people on the right, Tucker Carlson, those in Donald Trump's inner circle, they agree with Vance. It's how he got where he is now. In fact, we have new reporting that shows just how close Vance has been to the creators and visionaries behind the Project 2025 from the very beginning. We'll more on that next. Donald Trump keeps insisting he and his campaign have nothing to do with Project 2025. J.D. Vance makes that extremely difficult to believe. As the New York Times uncovered back in 2017, the Heritage Foundation, the right-wing group behind Project 2025, put out an equally weird series of essays lambasting IVF and abortion rights, scapegoating the poor, called the Index of Culture and Opportunity. We'll never guess who wrote that introduction to that report and delivered the keynote speech at its public release. What we're less comfortable talking about is this question of culture, and that's what I think is so important about this index and about the conversation we're having today. We're recognizing the importance of culture, and most of all, we're recognizing that it influences the opportunities that children who grew up in the circumstances that I grew up in, that it, that it affects their, their opportunities. Shel Goldberg is an opinion columnist for the New York Times, and she joins me now. You know that we, I remember the childless cat lady comment on Tucker Carlson at the time as being like really gross and offensive, but 
you could be forgiven for thinking like, oh, he's trying to play up to Tucker. Right. He thinks it's funny. Everybody that says it, something stupid sometimes. Yes, and now it's like every other day. No, it's day, a fixation. It's a fixation. And it's the way that he sort of, it's his go-to insult, right? Because it's it's about different kinds of people. It's about politicians. Oh, they're, I hate them because they're, they're so, they're corrupt because they're childless. They're not invested in the future. It's teachers. It's journalists, right? It's lawyers. It's kind of his go-to expression of contempt is to say that this group of people globally is childless. Yes, and what's striking about it, like in that riff that we played, you know, in the in the previous block, you're right here for it. If you took gender out of it and you said, look, elite culture just like tells people that oh, the most important thing is like these getting these these you know grabbing the brass ring and working all the time, I'd be like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah and like that's not great. And there's more to life than that. But it's always women. Well, it's absolutely. always women. It's women, women, women. Oh, no. Remember, he is married. You know, he's talking about getting these clerkships, becoming a corporate lawyer. I mean, that was his wife. He's until, talking about his wife. Right. Literally until this summer when she, you know, she quit her job after he became the vice presidential nominee. And yes, and he, it is with this sort of, you, it's interesting because when some of the original childless cat ladies comments, he said, well, I wasn't talking about people who can't have children. I was talking about people who choose not to have children. Now he's very explicitly talking about people who can't have children. Right. right? Because he says the, your biological window has closed. Right. And so it's this, um, you know, I didn't read Hill Lily LG when it came out. And so I didn't read it through the filter of the discourse at the time. Yes. I read it when he reemerged as a presidential or vice presidential prospect. And that is a book that just seeds with anger. Right. And Janie Vance is someone who was very ill treated by both of his parents. Both of them let him down phenomenally. But the amount of anger that he has at his mother for sort of not fulfilling her maternal role compared to the amount of anger that he has at his, at his father who put him up for adoption, it's just it's a completely different scale. And so, you know, he has this trauma that I think he then projects onto everything around him. He has this volcanic anger. That's a really good point. You know, one of the things that also comes through here is I think the feminist critique of the anti-abortion rights movement has always been whatever you say about life, you really are just obsessed with controlling women mm -hmm. and women's reproductive faculties and really thinking that that is the sum total of what right. it is, right? That's where value. Here's here's from the the, the, the report on pregnancy fertility mm -hmm. students at IVF back in 2017, right. right? Heritage. Between celebrities having children well into their 40s and companies adding benefits like egg freezing technologies, women are lured into the belief they can have children whenever they are finally ready. However, the biological clock is still alive and ticking when it comes to fertility. These limits need to be discussed in light of the new novel solutions to lure people into thinking they can defer motherhood to fit our own timeline. It's like so <laughs> dripping with contempt. Right, yeah, no, and I like... read that essay. And, um, and she doesn't, she, so the, right, the, the kind of nominal reason for opposition to IVF is because we think embryos are full human beings. Right. And, you know, which is, I think, kind of a, an out there position, but it's, a, it a the, morally consistent position. Yeah, it's right? the position of the Catholic Church, I should note. Yes. Right. Whereas this is a, you know, this is just pure sort of like you, this is, this is some kind of out. This is some sort of way in which you think that you could circumvent the natural life course that we have decreed for you. And yes. And the whole thing is just so dripping with like this desire to control how other people choose their li live their lives, specifically women, right. about how women live their lives and what's like, should we all go check with J.D. Vance? Like, should everyone, when he's vice president, does every woman have to check? Like, is 25, is it too late? Can I have it? Like, it's not your J.D. business. Like, I find it so weird. Well, I th and I think that people get that, right? That there's yes. this sort of weirdness. I mean, Donald Trump's problem, you know, Donald Trump has his own problem with women, but it's more like his kind of desire to like molest and objectify them is irrepressible. Whereas J.D. Vance's desire to condemn and control them is what's irrepressible. And people, I think they get that from him. Yeah. And I, I do think it's, it's interesting to think about the degree to which the Harris Walls campaign has more like how like they're just like sitting on some enormous podcast stockpile because every day there's a new one. Well, you know, I mean, I've said this on this show before. I still think that we don't pay nearly enough attention to the fact that J.D. Vance blurbed a book that came out this summer calling for fascism, like literally, you know, praising Francisco Franco and talking about how democracy isn't enough to destroy the kind of subhuman class. I mean, it's this really vicious book. I do think that there's so much jd vance has just done he spent so much time in that netherworld that there is probably an inexhaustible supply yeah and it's also it, it, that that, that the, the, the final point on this which i think is important is this stuff isn't accidental like him making 
the tour of podcast bros to go talk about this stuff is not unconnected to him getting the gig. Oh, right. Like, that's, that was the audition. Right, that, and that was also his path out of, like, never-Trumpism into the heart of Magadam. Yes.